There we are. Wonderful. Thank you. All uh, right. So our, so our next presenter is Natanya Nori, uh, and I think we are all quite interested in, you know, the idea of divergent translation, and um, she will be talking about uh, rhapsodic. So please take it away, Natanya. Thank you very much. Super excited to be presenting today. Uh, my name is Natanya Nori, and I'll be presenting on my experiments with divergent translation. Uh, in this presentation, I'll go over what that concept is, how it's relevant to conlanging, what I am referring to by it. I'll give a quick overview of the core grammar and concepts behind Rhapsodaic, a conlang of mine that utilizes this concept. And I'll share my experiences um, sharing this conlang with other people and testing these principles out in real time. So I'm going to begin with just a summary of the conlang itself. Uh, Rhapsodaic is a personal conlang, a heartlang of sorts. Among many that I have started and am currently working on, it is the first that I consider completed to a significant degree, and uh, as of today, the only one. It began as a cipher for writing English that I felt inspired to turn into a language proper, so that orthography and its inherent structures drove the rest of the language, and particularly comparisons between its structure and structures of systems of symbolism and correspondences that I had made separately for my own art and personal work. The, the kind of core intention for this language really pieced together once I had experimented sufficiently with how to turn this writing system into a language, but some retroactive design statements include syntactic simplicity combined with semantic fuzziness, aesthetic fantasticality, and perhaps most importantly, preservation of emotional content at the expense of material content. So when I speak, I could say is as well, symbolic content over material content. In English, for example, if I am very angry at someone, I might yell loudly at them or I might physically attack them. I, I probably won't, look at me. Um, but those are both different actions that I would do from the same emotional place. And naturally in English, we refer to them separately. Whereas in a passage talking about the full moon that speaks of it as a symbol of completion versus as a symbol of confusion and lunacy, the same phrase is used despite the different symbolic content. Um, as far as I'm aware, every natural language does this, and I imagine the majority of conlangs, and Rhapsodic is an experiment in flipping around this priority. Uh, so just a quick overview. There's some details I probably won't have time to go over in these slides. Uh, but Rhapsodic is primarily head initial, although uh, case marking allows for some flexibility in word order. There are three primary kinds of morphemes in the writing system of Rhapsodic, uh, which, by the way, is a solely written language. The core semantic morphemes are called stems, vertical lines of different heights and with different flourishes, each of which represents a particular emotion, a cluster of emotions, or an attitude towards an emotion. Most of these fall into groups that follow, as I was saying, these systems of symbolism that follow a sort of personally devised alchemical hero's journey where each group is a stage along this journey of growth and discovery. Uh, for example, I have here the, the stems that fall in the group S3. The, the abbreviations I use for these derive from the alchemical phrase solve et coagula, you know, dissolve and reform. So S3 is at the height of this disillusion phase, and it's all about confronting core issues, facing fears, getting to the heart of the matter. So within these subdivisions, the stem at the beginning, the familiar phrase, the, the familiar stem, the entry into this phase represents sort of these more mundane feelings of anxiety, insecurity, nervousness. Uh, as we get to the dangerous stem, kind of right in the middle of the phase, we get to wrongness and discomfort, horror, ill will, and the taboo. And coming out of the phase in the sort of more transcendent, wondrous stem, we get feelings of power, courage, bravery, uh, capacity, and nerve. And all of the main stems, with this exception of this group of attitude markers, like how much do you approve of the emotion you feel, how aware are you of it, um, all of them kind of fall into this hero's journey kind of structure. Words proper always consist of at least two stems, so the emotions that a single word can refer to can get fairly specific depending on which kinds of emotions one juxtaposes. And connecting lines are used to not only demarcate these words, 
uh, but denote their lexical class, their case, and their tense, uh, depending on the particular shape and slope of them. Each word by default refers to an emotion, an emotional concept, or an emotional experience. And so to refer to anything that isn't that, a system of diacritics are used as, I would say a noun class system, but they apply equally as well to verbs to sort of substitute the meaning of, of a word from being an emotion to a place, an action, a person that feels this emotion, causes someone else to feel this emotion, is somehow otherwise associated with this emotion. And as you can see, there's a lot of room for uh, ambiguity, but also specificity in the system. What's proven particularly useful for me is the specific markers for the first and second person to refer to the writer and reader of a given text or addressees and speakers in quoted passages. In personal writings of mine where I use Rhapsodaic to gain different perspectives on emotions that I'm experiencing, using the first person marker on multiple different emotions has been very helpful to refer to past versus present me, one part of me versus another. To say I of intense insight love myself of deep shame is a very different sentiment from I burnt out and frustrated love myself confident and full of energy. So there's a lot of nuance that can be communicated there. Here's an example sentence just to show um, these different components, the, the vertical lines that stems, the connectors between them and the diacritics, and also this sort of aesthetic fantasticality that I aim to give to Rhapsodaic. If we were to translate this word by word, we could go very granularly, kind of breaking apart each component uh, such that each word kind of requires an entire line to translate. Eye of enthusiastic joy, who is related to a being of furious strength, act in a way that is determined but playful, like these, these translations can get very wordy, uh, act in a way that evokes a sense of mischievous rebellion towards the sense of a sensation of calm and wise firmness, firmness et cetera. Uh, naturally, of course, this is um, the first line of the first verse of Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. And there are some interesting kind of techniques to take these particular words like a tiger or gravity or a shooting star and fit them into the framework of this language. For example, rather than rendering to be a shooting star as a verb, I incorporated the emotion that I would associate with the shooting star, this kind of enthusiastic, wonder-filled joy that's modified by like determination and desire to go after one's goals. And then in this first word, encoded it with the diacritic for the first person pronoun. So rather than I am a shooting star and I am leaping, it's shooting star me is leaping uh, through the sky like a tiger. We could, of course, take each of these words and translate them to refer to very different material things that may still keep the same emotional content. Uh, as an example sentence I took after writing this translation into Rhapsodaic, we could get, I, the freshman who everyone thinks looks like a bully for some reason, am giving a speech on following your dreams in the school auditorium, and it's jostling everyone's sense of defensiveness and commitment to this idea that they have to respect the authority they feel their peers have over them. Uh, here, the word that was once tiger has become bully. Uh, shooting star became freshman. And again, it shares that similar connotation of joy and enthusiasm, perhaps even naivete. Uh, the the two-word phrase for gravity has become uh, a need to respect the authority of one's peers rather than um, a calm and wise trust in connection. And so it's this process here where we get two very different sentences in English that is the core of what I refer to when I talk about divergent translation. For many conlangs, it is a priority to make sure that multiple readers can come to a similar translation of a given text, what I'm terming here as convergent translation. Divergent translation, on the other hand, is this process wherein Say I write out a text in language Y, here would be Rhapsodaic, with an intended meaning in, say, English, and someone translating reads out a meaning that makes as much sense in Rhapsodaic, but is drastically different from the original English meaning. And crucially, insight on the part of both parties, me and the translator, which in this case is also me, and other parties as well, can be arrived upon by comparing those two translations. Uh, both insight in terms of the meaning of the text, what does it mean to say that the physical force of gravity and the metaphorical force of peer pressure are in a way the same, 
and insight into both people who've done the translating. What does it mean that I associate those concepts with each other and perhaps another person doesn't? Why do I read this emotion as referring to a particular object and someone else doesn't see that connection at all? And what do we learn about each other as we discuss that? This is something other conlangs definitely do. Uh, Tokipona and other minimalist languages like that tend to have this effect where toki toki can mean hello, hello, or linguistic discussion, but Rhapsodic is really designed to dial this process up to the nth degree. Text in Rhapsodic should produce these wildly different results in regards to the material content when different people translate into and out of it, uh, and ideally preserve the emotional content, the symbolic content to some degree. And originally I was intending for this conlang to solely be personal, but my curiosity grew as to how would this play out if I actually share this material with other people? So in the abstract, I for, for this presentation, I said I sent a number of participants the full reference grammar and a dictionary, a short story written in Rhapsodic, and a short list of English words, and I asked each person to translate the material from one language into the other. That is all true. I did do all of that. After I wrote the abstract. I created a Discord server and reached out to a number of people. Um, this was now a time crunch, there was an adventure, and um, we, we worked on all of these projects, but as the months kind of went along, we realized there was only so much time to do this kind of experimentation, and we really would have to focus down on one task in particular, which is what I will be presenting to you today. So if anyone here is familiar with the game Exquisite Corpse, uh, it's a game where each person draws part of something, usually a person, on part of a piece of folded up paper without seeing anyone else's contributions. And then the paper is unfolded and the full thing is revealed and it always looks rather silly. So I did this with one paragraph of a Joyce Carol Oates short story. The most anyone participating knew was it is a short story and the author is Joyce Carol Oates. Most participants only knew that I had not written this myself, merely translated it. We had seven sentences in this paragraph overall and six participants, including myself. I filled in for a seventh who was unable to complete the translation and I just put myself to an honor code to not look back at the original too much. Uh, all participants had some second language learning experience. Uh, three have specifically conlang learning experience in the Tokipona community. So I assigned each person, including myself, a sentence to translate and put them together into a single exquisite corpse paragraph of a story. Um, each uh, color here denotes a different person translating a different sentence. I'll see you at home, I lied. I, all sweet and strong, will hold you steady, my love. You won't feel afraid, but calm. I'll see the full of who you are, your bold and vibrant love that makes itself exist. Home is bittersweet. It makes me aware. My family is intimidating. They are horrible fam family. They make me angry. They, of intimate malice, had wrongly indulged in it, that playful, spiteful, lonely thing. Even they, of excess malice, wanted more shameful, wonderful wrong. Though you are consumed by obsession, knowing that you will open your heart fills my heart with joy. Is it so painful? This love fulfills all your needs. Uh, I will say my text is somewhat cut off and I don't seem to be able to click to get the my camera out of the way. So I may not read all of this correctly. I would be enough if it were up to me, though I sense this is my folly. If you would love me and I loved another, would you ever love again? My friend and you, who is a toxic lover of my friend, is healing your relationship. You are embarrassed and putting something in its place. Mother is concerned, don't want, about it. There's not enough frustration. So we got a whole variety of uh, tones in which people wrote, styles in which people translated these words. You can see some people kind of leaned into this more granular translation where pronouns all get these uh, descriptors after them and there's these parentheticals where some kind of try to do a more natural to English translation. The original text to contrast is an excerpt from Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Again by Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, I won't be reading this out loud partly for time and partly because it is a bit uncomfortable. I chose this segment not just because it was a short story I was familiar with, but because I predicted I would get some fun tonal whiplash from revealing to people who had maybe construed this as having a different emotion that it is in fact this sort of story. So I'll, you know, that'll be available in the slides. Uh, if anyone wants to look later, it's the paragraph that opens with, we'll go out to a nice field and it gets much less nice from there. 
Uh, I don't have time again to go over all of the notable results, but a couple that stood out to me from here. Uh, a few lines or words were translated very authentically, especially words that had to do with family and familial relationships. House became family in one person's translation. Uh, Connie's people were rendered fairly accurately as her mother. Their people refers to family and close friends. Other times we got to see some significant divergence when the same word appeared in multiple lines. Looking solid for one person meant being intimidating and for another person meant being enough or satisfactory. Some elements of the story that are not mentioned outright, in part because I translated the story knowing its context, showed up in people's translations. Arnold Friend, the primary antagonist, his manner of speaking was translated as lying, which in the original, it's not called lying, but it most certainly is. So in some cases, the translation would favor Arnold's POV, even in narrated sections, and other times it seems to side with the narrator and reveal things that were not said outright in the original text of the story, but because I'm translating into a language that requires this degree of symbolic specificity, ended up being included and were able to be translated back out. So what wasn't able to happen with the time that we had was to get multiple people translating the same sentence and to have this back and forth communication that is primary to my idea of divergent translation. Because my initial expectation was that most of that communication process would happen within the translations themselves. As it happened, a lot of that also occurred as part of the process of teaching the language. About a month prior to right now, I hosted a Discord call where we went through the reference grammar bit by bit. I fielded questions, had people come up with example translations of words, and noticing people's translations of emotions that I wouldn't have expected, uh, questions that I wouldn't have foreseen people having, an explanation that was throwaway for me but made the entire premise of the language click for someone else, it, it really struck me as you know, I went into this project thinking like, oh yes, we're gonna explore this idea that people have these wildly different perspectives and then I get smacked in the face by the fact that people have wildly different perspectives. Uh, but even with the ideal experiment unable to be finished in time, this divergent translation process uh, still got to happen kind of in tandem with the language itself. I learned things about myself as well, the way that I tend to experience emotions on a very specific and context dependent level shows up pretty necessarily in the language of semantics, but that only clicked in my head after I shared this language with other people and other perspectives. And that was huge for me as someone who was only ever gonna originally keep this language to myself and felt very reluctant to share details about it with other people at first. I was struck by how how readily a whole community formed around it. That was one of my initial anxieties was like, how, how much am I going to be able to communicate this to people and how invested are people going to be in something that's so personal to me? Um, but just to take some excerpts from paragraphs when I asked people to talk about their experiences with this whole project, um, people had a lot of fun with it, described experiences of fitting like puzzle pieces together and you know, using the language to reconsider how they describe very basic concepts. Um, wanting to wax poetic about the experience, even before the translation had begun. Um, people sharing experiences that they ha didn't have the right words for in English and hoped they would in Rhapsodaic. Like it kind of blew me away to see this whole community um, build up over this language. Um, just a couple of other fun examples here where even people who weren't able to participate in the translation experiment still worked with the language, found ways to translate personal experiences that they had, wax philosophical about the language. Uh, one particular friend of mine in the server is currently hosting the reference grammar on their website with you know, SVG versions of all of these stems, connectors, and diacritics. It was a experience that I absolutely was not expecting that yeah, blew me away is the phrase I keep coming back to. And I, actually only a couple hours today did I learn that I can make a permanent um, invite link to the Discord server. So however is best to do that, I may share after this presentation if other people are interested in joining this community. So in part because this experiment went uncompleted, but maybe in part because of the things I was investigating, my conclusion is a lot more about the questions than it is the answers. Languages fundamentally are about sharing and conveying information with other people. Is there a fixed way that they have to do that? Are there these other indirect means of communication around language that get to be part of this linguistic 
sharing of information. What facets of language, what, what facets of experience do languages tend to prioritize or deprioritize? And as we create languages, what priorities do we want to include in them? And which priorities have we maybe not considered as clearly? Many things can be lost in translation, particularly as translations are enforced or presented without context. But when different parties are able to both communicate and participate, what knowledge gets to be gained in translation? I don't have full tied up with the bow answers to these, and I don't know that I ever will. Certainly more rigorous and more extensive experimentation into Rhapsodic and languages like it would be extremely helpful in learning more of the uses and the limits of the strategy. But even from what I've been able to do so far, I can strongly recommend divergent translation as a concept for any conlanger interested in this sort of experimentation to play around with and work with, uh, not just as an intellectual exercise, um, but as a personal one as well. As I was writing the slides for this, I kept coming back to a quote from, it's Branson Reese's review of Star Trek Into Darkness. Maybe every franchise should collapse into a version of itself that makes shareholders smile and shake each other's hands. We, I, again, I can't see the end of that part there. We should learn to speak in a language that rich people who don't dream can't comprehend. Uh, I regret to inform you that Rhapsodic, after all this, will not be that language, certainly not on its own. If I took my personal framework for making sense of these emotions and then just said, this is the way to do it, this would be against the entire point. Um, I will level with everyone here. I was at a loss for words as to what I wanted to say in this section. And then remember that I have a tool for when that happens. So I tried translating it into Rhapsodic first. The general sentence I was trying to work with to get more insight into was if conlangers create languages like this, new opportunities get opened up by the things that we learn. But I had to get very specific. What kind of opportunities? What kind of things do we learn? What does languages like this mean? What is that act of creation? And what is the symbolic content behind being a conlanger? And what I was struck by was unintentionally, I formed the word for a person who makes languages and this feeling of curiosity about other people's experiences, a connection that is driven by that uncertainty, using this, the same shape, the same kind of phases on this hero's journey. One roughly translates as analytical self-expression and one as connection through curiosity. But the, the core shape is the same. It's the details that differ and perhaps isn't all language divergent or convergent or otherwise about getting curious about other people's experiences and trying to bridge the gap between them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natanya. Um, you're, you're getting a lot of love in the YouTube comments, so definitely recommend you pop over and check those out uh, when Will you have the do. opportunity. Um, Absolutely. One that particularly stuck with me um comparisons to ithkul but like if ithkul had a really good poetry teacher once in high school <laughs> yeah i <laughs> it definitely strikes me yet yeah, like it, um rhapsodic is a language that has it's it's interesting to me in that way that there is a very precise degree of specificity in this one particular domain uh one example word that i've used when talking to people about it is a word for a feeling I've gotten when I like realize something about myself or a thing that I do and I didn't know why that it's this combination of like embarrassment that I didn't realize it and a little bit of grief over the fact of what it is but still being able to feel like lighthearted and compassionate and it's something that like takes me like these multiple sentences to say properly and it's one word in this language yep it, it's awesome. There were a lot of comments about the writing system that you made too, and and how it kind mm. of looks like musical notes. Were were you influenced? Uh, your, the writing does uh, kind am, of look like sheet music. I am a very musical individual. Um, this particular, I I looked through like my journals to find like the original uh, form of this writing system, but was more inspired by like various doodles that I had done rather than um, music proper. Although I appreciate the comparison. So this is what the the original draft of the writing system back when it was used to write English looked like. Um, I found in a later journal um, some initial attempts to try and map meaning onto those symbols. Uh, it was originally called Levian from the Hebrew word for heart, live. Um, yeah. 
no, that is that is absolutely awesome. I'm not seeing questions come in on the YouTube, but just a lot of comments. Like people want to see an an fMRI of people understanding uh, rhapsodic. Um, I did just see a um a comment yes. there. Um, if I can write translate something in real time, I um where is my pen that I have? I know there's there's one over here. Um, I absolutely could. Awesome. FMRI talk. Uh, were you part of the Conlang Relay? I was not part of the Conlang Relay now. Oh, okay. I, I was really um, hoping because we did have a, been... a conscript relay this time around too. But... Ooh. Yeah. Would have been very interesting to do. Um, let me hop over, look at the YouTube chat very quickly. I see all of the, I posted the link in um, in Mapona Pitogipona, uh, that Discord server. I'm seeing some great comments from those people. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm just Yes, I can. What I can write out too, because um, I wasn't, I didn't have a graphic in there that really made clear like the the correspondence between those stems and the um, the system of correspondences. But I can write out very quickly that the pattern looks something like this here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so each of those stems representing a point along that journey, the way that I managed to hold that all in memory is kind of through using the, these are the familiar versions of the stems, kind of, I, it starts here and then loops around that way. Um, and each phase is roughly, um, there's like the initial discovery and contemplation of ideas, and then the going further with them as you realize the difference between like what is and what could be. And then there's that, you know, the S3, the confronting of the core of the matter. There's the stage of like recovery and rest and like self-compassion. There's then getting clear on what it is you want having come out of all of that and sort of venturing outwards to explore it. Um, Six stage is starting to take action towards pursuing those things. Seventh is where it's like kind of test your knowledge, see what you've learned so far, get solid in like the experience that you've had. And then stage eight is, you know, looking back on the whole journey with a sense of like, wow, I did that and being able to relax again. Well, you are certainly able to relax again because it was very, very well received, both uh, in apparently your your online group and also the the many people watching on YouTube mm -hmm. right now. So thank you very much for sharing that with thank us. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. If I could ask 